Football on Off the Ball. With Sky. Watch over 400 games this season from the Premier League, WSL, Scottish Premiership, and EFL. Live on Sky Sports. Now then, you're welcome back. So, Premier League starts this Friday. La Liga starts on Friday weekend. It's been an interesting summer at Barcelona in particular. Very happy to say, Mr. Graeme Hunter, who I presume is very excited, is with us. Hello, Graeme. Those of happy and excited, baby. Yeah. Where are you in the world at the moment? No, I'm in, in my front living room looking out at uh, a sunny Saria. It's in Catalonia. I'm ready to roll. I haven't been far this summer. Some interviews... Big interviews coming up with um, uh, two Premier League managers and a Scott playing his trade in Syria. A little bit of an adventure on a boat on Loch Ness, but but back and and not putting it on because you've asked me. Just pawing the ground <laughs> to get tucked into La Liga. Um, I'm of that. I'm of that breed, Joe. Um, whereby <clears throat> six or seven days after the league is finished, in all of my reporting seasons. You're like, you know, thank God we've got a break. Man, that's a hectic pace. My head is spinning. Six or seven days later, you're like, not just where's the football, where's the story, where's the interview? How can I, I miss I miss a football stadium, I miss training grounds. It lays, you know, if I'm frank, I miss this, I miss the TV studio. Just a whole package of being around football, watching the ball being kicked, watching ideas been picked apart or laid out watching strategy in the, in the transfer market come to fruition rather than simply talking about it. All that kind of stuff, it takes me the blink of an eye to start missing and to be ready to go again. Well, we are ready to go again. Barcelona of interest this summer. So they have, as we know, been wrestling with some fairly major uh, financial problems. And Juan Laporta revealed last week they were $1.35 billion in the red and that player salaries accounted for 103% of all income which is not a great situation so whatever way they've managed it they have rearranged their uh, house financial levers I think the phrase uh, being used in effect they've um, well sold against all future uh, TV money 25% of uh, future TV money for the next 25 years and they've sold against their uh, merchandising earnings over uh, the foreseeable as well for a percentage and uh, in short, they've raised a whole bunch of cash. So what are we to think of this, Graeme? There's, there are two other things that if we want to make this um, one of the instances where this, uh, this subject, and the reason I come and talk to you is that I'm confident that it'll be, it'll be treated forensically, but also <laughs> accurately, because I can't speak for Ireland, but in the United Kingdom, the reporting on this subject for months has been just atrocious, abysmal. Right. You know, straight out of thinking and, and analysis and vocabulary, straight out of the rubbish bin. Um, so therefore, I'll start by saying that there are, there are two further points to add to yours. They have sold part of Barca Studios, which, which is to, to me is one of the biggest tricks they pulled out for. You know, a mere hundred million was announced yesterday, and it, it, it's the relatively fresh studio concept that they that they are makers of their own programs and that they have um, audiovisual um, production and direction professionals is tied to the club. And they've sold a chunk of that for 100 million with the potential for selling another 100 million of that next week if their process of trying to register the new signings they've got. When you register it, it's an equation. You don't go before a court. You don't just say, like, you know, take this paperwork. It isn't done by facts. It's done by an app. It, it, it's, a, it's an algorithm. You, you fill in all the details. You say, this is the money that, we, that we've... Um, that we've cleared out of our salary bill. This is the money that we've, the revenue that we've raised, which is what you were referring to, Joe. Um, here are the players th that we'd like to bring in and register on these salaries. And there, there are any number of criteria which click like pieces in a Swiss watch in order for you to have met La Liga's uh, demands in, in terms of the broad title is obviously financial fair play. And Barcelona talked about, um, we believe our interpretation is. So they, I, I, I don't think they're out there talking a load of bull um, about their perception that their number crunchers say that they think they should be able to register Lewandowski and Kessier and Rafinha and Christensen and Dembele and Sergio Roberto are, are, are clearly on this too. And the last signing 
Zul Kunde. The, the last thing I'll say is that, Joe, that since the spring, if you count the sponsorship by Spotify of, you know, the, the, the training ground and the stadium, it's now, Camp now Spotify, you know, they've taken in something in the region of 850, maybe 900 million. <coughs> they, they, they've they announced, or they've briefed, is a better way to say it. I'm sorry, Joe, that if their negotiations with the algorithm, with the app at La Liga for uh, registering the players don't go well, <laughs> they'll they'll sign off another X percent of Barca Studios for another 100 million. Right. Now, in terms of the proof is in the pudding, you, you'll be asking me, <laughs> just think they're going to pull it off. Is it the right thing to do strategically? There have been a lot of people talking about the morality of it. Fine. All of these things come into play. I, I will not, in any of my answers, go outright and, and defend Barcelona's strategy. I'll analyse it. But above all, I want people who listen, who care, whether they're angry about what Barcelona are doing, whether they are delighted, or whether they're just curious about watching probably the deepest debt a football club has ever been in, being uh, roulette wheeled this in this manner, then all I want to do is is make sure that people have the accurate facts in front of them for themselves to for them to draw their own conclusions. Well, I mean, it's a fascinating turnaround. So, take for instance uh, Sixth Street, who are the company who've have done. Uh, uh, I, well, I don't want to say all the deals of Barcelona, but certainly for the TV rights, they've taken the TV rights. So they have given Barcelona. Uh, 500 million for this percentage of TV rights over the next 25 years. And I was reading a piece, and I'm now slightly worried because I've generally been relying on the English media, but from Sixth Street's point of view, they reckon that the rights they have bought from Barcelona uh, could be worth up to about 1.5 billion, and they've given Barcelona 500 million for them. And so both parties are pretty happy, Sixth Street for obvious reasons, and Barcelona because their need is great at the moment. I mean, I, on the... Uh, the outrage or the morality uh, point of view. I mean, I think there is some nagging uh, Catholic uh, guilt in me here. What you, what, you know, once you should suffer Barcelona for the the mismanagement of the club, but really, I mean, they're perfectly entitled to borrow against future earnings, and they've clearly decided, Graham. And I, I don't think it's um, a, 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 a bad way of looking at the situation. They've clearly decided we are going to have a financially sticky-ish time over the next number of years. It's not going to be as lucrative as it, as it could have been because of the mess we've we've got ourselves into. Our best way out of this is not to spend 10 years uh, serving penance and being poor on the football field. Our best way out of this is to be as good as we can on the football field and we'll make more money as, as a result. And, and frankly, any president at Barcelona knows we need to be winning things or pretty quickly I'll be under pressure. So as for the rights and wrongs of it, I, I, I agree it's, it's tricky to know, but I can certainly see why they've gone down this route. I think that's an important way to introduce it to anybody who's who's been spending the, uh, the season watching the Bulls or Ireland beat the Black, beat the Blacks or whatever you want to, you know, England cricket. It doesn't matter what, if you haven't been watching La Liga and analysing it. The way you've punted it is this: that there's a clear and definable and accountable strategy. I think that um, outside. Catalonia, probably, certainly outside La Liga. There was a long time where Barcelona were really only having their legs pulled for the inane way in which they spent money and went into debt and, and, and took no cognizance of the fact that something might happen. Now, what happened, none of us knew for sure in any way that there'd be a pandemic that would ruin finances for a couple of years. But I suppose in an accounting, in accounting principles, you must always try not to... It's like it's the same as any scaffy up a ladder. And if you're reaching for that tile or to clean that window or whatever, you, you want the ladder to be secured and you don't want to think, listen, that, that last three feet, I can reach on my tiptoes and the top wrong and nobody's holding the ladder down below, but it won't fall. Now, the, the critical analysis of how the previous president, Bartomeu, on his board utterly used that Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton model about it'll be fine. Mm. Ah, shit, it hasn't been. Is now nobody's analysing that. Nobody's bringing that into play in terms of where Barcelona are at. It's a different board, it's a different president, it's a different coach. Same fans, same institution, but people are hurling uh, muck at, at the brand, at the name. Now, it's imperative to realise that although Barcelona, the institution, are in this this deep, deep hole. Um, because of people that were employed there and because of people that were democratically elected, they were incompetent. And I like what you said, that 
whether people approve or do not approve of the way in which they've sold us some of the future, and I guess I'm talking to a nation where a lot of people, particularly in the capital of Ireland, have, have sold off equity in their houses because the market's gone crazy, and you're like, there's easy cash. We'll have it. Doesn't matter. Spend now. Spend now because it's imperative. Spend now to have fun, mm. live fast, die young. Don't know. Mm. At Football Club Barcelona, there's several things that you can begin to say analytically, and I do not mean to defend them, is that if you look at the calibre of signings, whether it be Christensen on a free, Kessie in the midfield, who will be the surprise hit, I think, of the season, Rafinha, Koundé is an obvious one, an absolute gem of a talent, a Nations League winner, 90 minutes in the semi-final against Belgium, 90 minutes in the final win against Spain. He should be a central part of Deschamps' attempt to retain the World Cup in Qatar. What Chelsea wanted him, he should have gone there. Barcelona spent two months telling Koundé's agent to stop phoning. Yeah, we want him. There's absolutely no news. We're in no position to buy him. If you have to sort your future, take one of those big offers. Chelsea, in other words. And could they still wait it? Lewandowski told Bayern, Bayern Munich, stop making proposals for me to either renew or to stay the last year of my contract. I'm going to Barcelona. Hmm. Paris Saint-Germain wanted him. Chelsea wanted him. He just roundly said no. And it's not for the quality of life here. There are, there are players who have said... I'll stake things. In Lewandowski's case, particularly, given that he's 34 and on match day two of, of La Liga, he signed for a club when he had tons of choices to stay in elite football in three different countries other than Spain. He signed for a club where he doesn't know that he'll be registered and time to play against Raya Vallecano on August the 30th. That's extraordinary. Mm. Now, in order to make that happen, not to convince him, because that's been chavy, in order to make that happen, as you said, Barcelona have generated lots of cash. They've said, we'll deal with the future once we're successful. Mm. And if you want to nutshell it, then this is the way to look at it. it is, they want to compete domestic with Real Madrid. They will never say we don't want to win the league. It's all about that chill, the winter chill that went from their ankles right up to their, their genitals last year when they were knocked out of the Champions League in the group stage. Yeah. If you go to the last row of the Champions League, Joe, you know that you're, you're gross should be upwards of 100 million each season. Four or five seasons, in the, if they can achieve it, in the last four of the Champions League, will take them in gross four or 500 million. Yeah. That doesn't end their problems. And the last thing they need to do is win the tournament, pay out all the bonuses to the players, and then reduce the what the gross is to a very small net. But they need to perform in the Champions League. And you're right, that's one of the major things that they've staked by saying, we'll make a competitive team, we'll bring back pride, we'll bring new sponsors, we'll bring new investment because we're we're brilliant, because we're revered again, because we're feared again. Now, football's a, a quixotic sport. Maybe they fail in it. But as you introduced this long answer, it, it, it's a very clear and easily understood mm. strategy. Yeah, Whether I you think... approve of it or not, it's a different thing. Well, I think so too. And uh, the worst thing they could do with 1.3 billion of debt is to stink the joint out on the pitch for the next 10, 15 years. That You're is right. not going to shift that right. debt at all. And it's not that outlandish a thing to do to borrow against future earnings. You know, this is like, this has been talked about as some kind of financial chicanery in some respects. I mean, the more you read about it, as you said, it's a fairly transparent plan. It's just spreading the debt over the next number of years, which again is a perfectly reasonable business decision. In terms of the criticism, Graeme, because that's an interesting aspect of this. So Julian Nagelsmann was the most high profile individual I saw throwing some shade on Barcelona. He said of the Lewandowski departure, it's the only club in the world where they've no money, but then they buy all the players they want. I don't know how they do it. It's a bit strange. It's a bit crazy. Now, I'd be interested to chat to Nagelsmann now that he does know how they do it because it's been laid out in fairly clear no, terms. No, he, no, may wait, well, wait, wait. He, he may well say, OK, I can you, see how they do it. You, but, but you're, def you're, you're defending the, the indefensible there. We, we as, as reporters, as journalists, as, as, a, as a medium, as important as, as news talking off the ball, we, we need Nagelsmanns of this world to talk. Sure. We want them to ex express their opinions. But I'm, I'm just but making the point. He's been no better than the man in the pub, Joe, he, there, by saying... I don't know how they do it. Money and I don't know how they do it. Well, they haven't got any money. They, they're just taking in, touching on eight fifty nine hundred million since spring. Yeah. It's, 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 to defend him, he's been busy, you know, winning trophies exactly. from Bayern exactly. Munich. But it, 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 they don't have no money. And it, he's a bit pissed off because they lost Lewandowski. And they're a club with a completely, you talked about Catholic guilt, they've got a completely old school Presbyterian sure. attitude about how they manage their affairs, what debt is and isn't. And, and, and this whole cycle that we're in started now, if you remember, 
when Pep Guardiola's Barcelona utterly tore apart Lyon and Barcelona, trashed uh, Bayern Munich, trashed them. And at that stage, Bayern Munich, um, in, you know, what are we talking now, 15, 16, 17 years ago, they, they were structurally, they went, this is our weight on it. We're Bayern, we'll attract people because of who we are, because of our history, because people think they'll win with us all the time, and we'll pay reasonable wages. They were, they were a little bit like the old school Arsenal and the Wenger. Mm. But here's our wage structure. Now they've begun to have to move with the times they've had to change that a little bit, and they're a bit ticked off at having lost Lewandowski without, without a like-for-like like re replacement. So I understand where his animus comes from, but his comments were not much better than, you know, going down, you know, to, to a pub in Grafton Street saying, Listen, fella, what do you think of Boston? Oh, they've got no money, hardly spending money. Mm. It's a disgrace. You know, thanks, Julian. No, fair point. Nagelsmann aside, though, I was curious, who's throwing the most shade on Barcelona? Where is the criticism coming from? Well, it depends. You, you take your pick. It, it, largely, it's not coming from within Spain. One of the most notorious ones over the last few days has been Gary Neville on social media, which has been, if you know Gary and you've worked with him, a cross between deeply held union principles, uh, a half understood grasp of the case, and a, and a, and a, and a wish to, to stir things up because he loves a row, absolutely thrives on it. And he's ticked off the fact that Frankie Dion won't come to his beloved Manchester United. So that's a heady cocktail, some of which he's absolutely right on. And if, if some of the things he said were true about the way in Barcelona are dealing with the Frankie Dion case, then I'd probably be on Gary Neville's side. Sadly, some of the things he said, you know, bore very little relation to the truth and polarised things when the key thing that anybody who, who's saying... Um, Bustle and I are trying to put Frankie De Jong on, on water and gruel and it's it's a disgrace that they're trying to take away all his money would need to understand a couple of things one, he was renewed by the departed incompetent president to a salary level which he didn't deserve at that time and hasn't merited since and while he's entirely within his rights to say no Bustle would be incompetent if they weren't trying to renegotiate, renegotiate either his, his salary in his contract or what they owe him. That would be incompetent. He's been paid upwards of 11 million euros a season net of tax, net of tax. That means he's been paid in the mid to high 20s in millions in euros. Now, he neither, neither merited that when he was signed nor on his performances. And if they tried to change his contract, he and his agent and his lawyers are a thousand percent within the rights to say, tough luck, mm, no. Yeah. But Barcelona would be ultimately stupid not to be saying to him, here's the real situation. Um, we do want to move you on. And irrespective of the nice things that Laporta and Charlie have said about it, they do want to move Frankie de Jong out for various reasons. The principle of which is that he hasn't been good enough. That's a, that's a simple, easily observed fact. Fair enough. Well, I, I hope he takes them for every cent they promised him because that's their own incompetence Fair enough. coming to the fore. Fair enough. Except, except, Joe, except yeah. Joe, hold on in football. To take a beyond Frankie de Jong, mm. in football there is always uh, an end of contract negotiation between the agent, the player and the club, always. Like, how much will you pay me to go away? Well, we won't. Um, this is what we're going to offer you. You won't play very often. And in Frankie de Jong's case, number one, he doesn't want to go to Manchester United, not because of the financial negotiations with Barcelona, but because he doesn't want to play for a team in the Europa League. And he doesn't want to play for a team which would resemble the way Barcelona have been playing over the last couple of seasons. Mm. That's a fair point. And people around that story need to take that as the number one reality. And the number two reality that nobody's reporting on is that well, Barcelona will not freeze him out and not use him. Mm. He, If the players that they bought are registered, there's a very very high chance that he will play minimally between now and the World Cup, where he and Louis van Gaal and the, the rest of the Orange Machine have got a very easy group and stand to go out of that and, and make a run as deep as, as the Netherlands are capable of making in Qatar. Now, a player like Frankie de Jong doesn't want to be lacking in game time coming into the World Cup. So it's, it's a poker game, while I still agree with you. If they are trying to brutalise him, if they're trying to say, well, we just we're just not doing that. Instead of negotiating, then you know, stick in. We, we have to be for workers' rights. We have to be for the sanctity of a contract. But negotiating, trying to renegotiate, trying to reassemble an adequate picture based on the way in which some nonsensical decisions have been made about them in the past by a previous board. 
I think that's fair. To take a 3D look then at this uh, manoeuvring this summer on Barcelona's part, this, this um, raising of revenue, what's the biggest criticism you could make of it or what is the big criticism of it, Graeme? That's a really stinging question, Joe. Look, clearly, the, the biggest criticism is, is of the untrammeled, um, unfettered incompetence that got them in that, this situation. Sure. Next... Um, I would say that there needs to be criticism of the board and of Joanne Laporta for taking so long to appoint Chabi and for having taken so long to bring in Jordi Cruyff and Matteo Aleman, who are who with Laporta and Chabi for on the four man team that are actually making competent uh, football decisions about who to move out and who to move in. They've become, a, whether they win, lose, or draw, they become a competent football club again. In terms of the pure finances, mm. Joe, I can report on what, what I know, but. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm a brilliant financial analyst to say where is the, the thing I would criticise most. Mm. Um, clearly, over all our careers, we've learned it's better to get your selling done before you buy. And in some instances, that simply hasn't been possible. It's left them looking a little bit embarrassed in terms of how many of the players they need to get out. And had they been able to assure themselves categorically that they could register the players that they've signed, that would have been a far better position than they're in right now, where currently, as we speak, they're crunching numbers trying to make make the, the app at La Liga, which regulates whether they can register all these players in time, either for the Rio game on August 13th or thereafter, until the deadline at the end of August, the last day of signing, I think September the 1st. At the moment, as we speak, it's not crystal clear that every single player that they've signed or... Who's, who's signed a new contract, such as Roberto and uh, Usman Dembele, will be able to be registered. Now, imagine a fuss if one, two, three, four of them have to wait until uh, January to be registered to, to play football club Barcelona. Mm. There, there's where my criticism would lie, that, okay. that being utterly assured of that before you bring them in and announce them would have been a far more mature way to do it. Fair enough. Well, if it all works as they're uh, billing it, this will be one of the great rabbits uh, pulled out of hat manoeuvres I think we've seen in recent times. Just a a very brief word if you can. We'll talk about Real Madrid in more depth at another point over the next week or two. But um, I was just uh, glancing through the age of the squad and we have Courtois, who admittedly is a goalkeeper so it's less of an issue, but Courtois, Alaba, Carvajal, Casemiro, Kroos, Modric, who's 37 in September, Hazard, Karim Benzema, all uh, into their 30s now and Carlo Ancelotti 63 and I was thinking God what poor Real Madrid struggling to regenerate and then you should remind yourself my God we're talking about the La Liga and Champions League champions 2022 Uh, so what have they been doing over the uh, summer? They've taken in so many who I think um, will be important in midfield because you, you can see given the fact that Deschamps again played him in that Nations League victory and he's racked up at a relatively tender age, plenty of games uh, for Bordeaux and, and Monaco. So many being brought in is um, a similar bet to Camavinga in terms of how long he's going to be allowed in order to hit the ground and integrate. Camavinga, by the end of the season, had become gigantically yeah. important, yeah. which for a lad of his age is incredible. To bring in Rudiger um, doesn't necessarily decrease the age profile massively, but in terms of height and power, which is something that they needed, in terms of a, a centre half who can give Alaba particularly a game here or there of rest, rotate on form, those are two very good signings. It's patently clear that lowering the age profile of the squad if they intend to win both of those trophies or indeed win the first ever trophy treble of, of, of Cup League and Champions League in their history. Just just think on that for a second, Real Madrid. Mm. If they want to do that, then clearly it, it's fair to say that tiredness and injury across a season, a mad season, where the majority of Real Madrid's players will be performing in Qatar. And none of us know what it's going to be like to have a massive tournament for the European footballers in the middle of a season and then come back and go smack bang, helter skelter in the league again. It will be like what we discovered at the end of the pandemic, which teams were best prepared, which teams were freshest, which teams were in, in utter pieces like Barcelona were when they faced Bayern Munich. So there's going to be surprises in the second half of this season thanks to this unwanted, unnecessary um, split of the season thanks to you know FIFA's decision to put the, the, the tournament in Qatar. And 
I wonder if, if Real Madrid at this stage are fully ready, but there's another market to come. And the key way to answer your question is, I don't believe knowing those players, that their hunger, that their attention to detail, that their training under their Italian fitness coach, who's made such a difference to them, will, will drop. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of them are at the outside limit in terms of being able to be excellent. But I think your question was about durability across a long, strange season. And where they are most weak right now, without any question, is if Karim Benzema were absent for any reason whatsoever. Yeah. At that stage, I think it's a dreadful problem for them. But in the in the in the two important signings, there's been another Brazilian fullback. In the two important signings they've made, they've been astute. They'll be important, but I don't think Real Madrid's business, despite Ancelotti saying it's finished, can properly be finished if the right player becomes available up front. Okay, very good, Graham. Enjoy your evening. Pleasure. Joe, it's your man. <laughs> Long overdue. Thank you very much, Graham Hunter, uh, with us on the football show this evening, brought to you by Sky. Watch over 400 games this season from the Premier League, WSL, Scottish Premiership, and EFL Live on Sky Sports Short Break. Football on Off the Ball. With Sky. Get all the football you love in one place across Sky Sports, BT Sport, and Premier Sports.